The Ganymede Hypothesis, Executive Summary Copyright 2021 Theodore Holden Gravity is by 40 orders of magnitude the weakest force in nature. The idea that gravity mainly controls what we see in the heavens, the so-called gravity-only cosmology, is a habit of thinking more so than anything which could ever be demonstrated. In real life, asking gravity to form up a solar system from swirling dust or to hold a spiral galaxy together, is like asking the littlest kid in the school to do the powerlifting event. It does not really make any sense. In real life, it is the electromagnetic forces which are 40 orders of magnitude stronger than gravity, which do the heavy lifting. Another habit of thinking which turns out to be wrong, is the idea of stars being thermonuclear engines. A thermonuclear furnace star would simply keep on getting cooler as you moved further away from its core. Our sun does not do that, it gets vastly hotter as you move upwards from the surface into the upper layers. Likewise, a sunspot is a place where the electrical activity of the surface breaks down, and you are seeing into the interior of the star. If our sun were a thermonuclear furnace, a sunspot would be blue or white, and not black. The interior of the sun is obviously cooler than the surface. What turns out to be the case is that stars are basically light bulbs and not thermonuclear furnaces. Stars are plasma physics phenomena, powered by cosmic Birkeland currents. This includes both main-sequence stars such as our Sun, and dwarf stars such as Jupiter and Saturn used to be. How is that? All ancient religions were astral in nature, the curious name associations between ancient pantheon gods and our planets are primordial. Primitives seeking to devise an astral religion from scratch in our own age, would invariably end up worshipping the Sun, the Moon, and possibly Venus. However, the two chieftain gods of all ancient religions were the two former dwarf stars, Jupiter and Saturn, and particularly Saturn. Vestiges of that ancient reality still surround us. We still call our Sabbath Saturn's Day, the main religious festival in ancient Rome was Saturnalia, Virgil notes, Enid, that Rome itself was built over top of the remains of a more ancient city called Saturnia, Plato consistently refers to antediluvians as nurslings of Kronos, or Saturn. Classical authors including Hesiod and Ovid refer to a golden age when Kronos, Saturn, was king of heaven. In the same language, our sun is the king of heaven now. When a dwarf star is captured by main-sequence star, the dwarf star dies out and becomes a gas giant planet. It is as if a 200-foot lightning rod was glowing in a storm when, of a sudden, the Acme Lightning Rod Company's truck rolled up and employees got out and constructed a thousand-foot lightning rod a couple of hundred feet away. The smaller lightning rod, no longer the focal point of any kind of a discharge, would simply go out and cease glowing. Another funny thing which has turned up is that the most normal situation for gas giant planets in our galaxy is for them to be up substantially closer to main sequence stars which the orbit than Jupiter or Saturn are now, hence the term hot Jupiters which we read. At least one scholar who studied such things, John Cook, Planimid to have done calculations putting Jupiter a bit closer to our sun than Earth is now in past ages. That would, of course, transform Ganymede, Jupiter's largest moon, from its present status as an icy wasteland, into a freshwater ocean world. Space is a plasma environment and not a vacuum. There are charge separations across vast regions of space and, because of those charge separations, we see Birkeland currents arcing across huge regions. Those are twisted pairs of currents which look like DNA slash RNA strings. Where those current pair cross each other, there is electrical short-circuiting and what are called Z-pinches, and those electromagnetic pinches do have the power to agglomerate plasma into much more solid objects, including protostars and stars. A Birkeland current with such objects showing at its pinch points is called a herbig harrow object or herbig harrow string, and looks like a shish kebab with the shishes all lit up or a string of Christmas tree lights with a string pulled taut. Herbig Harrow String 20. That is basically what a young solar system looks like, an electromagnetically aligned system and not an orbiting system like our present system. On a very much larger scale, Barkland currents create strings of galaxies at their pinch points. The exact same phenomenon, just at a different scale. Standard science theories have no explanation for strings of galaxies. At least that is how stars appear to form up. What about rocky bodies, planets such as Earth and Mars? It is conceivable that such planets could also form up as parts of Herbig slash Harrow strings, 
but more likely seems to be the kind of scenario which Emanuel Velikovsky and Alda Grazia described in which such bodies would be fissioned off by a dwarf star as a mechanism for relieving electrical stress. Hence Troy McLaughlin's interpretation of such a dwarf star-centered system in which rocky bodies like Earth or Mars exist within the plasma sheath heliosphere of a dwarf star, with the outside universe basically hidden from them by that opaque plasma heliosphere. One part of the idea is that such a planet would have radiant energy coming in from all sides as it bounced off the interior of that plasma heliosphere. You wouldn't freeze to death but the entire middle part of the light spectrum would simply be missing, you'd be living in a deep, dark purplish sort of a world, which the oldest oral traditions on Earth describe as a purple dawn. You might expect the creatures of such a world to have huge eyes. In fact, they all did. The huge eyes you observe with dinosaur and hominid remains are adaptations for such a darkish environment. Leftover creatures of that age, tarsiers, lemurs, owls and the like, retain those kinds of eyes. Neanderthal eye sockets are very much larger than ours. Accurate reproductions such as those of Danny Vendramini, show the Neanderthal to be a fabulously bug-eyed creature. Danny Vendramini's reconstructions in fact show the Neanderthal with a fur coat. Early human needles are common, but nobody has ever found the first Neanderthal needle, because a creature with a six-inch fur coat does not require needles. If you're worried about having anything like that in your family tree, you can stop worrying. The idea of any kind of a hominid to human evolution simply does not pass a basic sniff tests for logic. For any hominid to have ever evolved into a human, that hominid would have to have lost everything he needed to live, thrive, and survive. Particularly, he would have to have lost. 1. His fur, while ice ages were in progress. 2. Almost all of his night vision. 3. Almost all of his sense of smell. And all of that while trying to make it as a land prey animal. Not much of a plan. Rob Gargut, subversive archaeologist, notes that even if you try to draw a more yuppified or humanized Neanderthal with a nose and eyes as large as the bones indicate they would have to be, what you end up with is still outlandish. Now, humans and dolphins have the smallest relative eye sizes of advanced creatures. For this reason and a number of others, at least a few scholars, Lloyd Pye for example, have determined that humans could not have originated on this planet. Eye sizes in fact amount to one of the main motivations for the Ganymede hypothesis. Those motivations are Planetary axis tilts Eye sizes Human aquatic adaptations Human physical limitations and safety requirements The thing about axis tilts Given any reasonable theory as to how a solar system like ours would form up you would expect these spin axes of the planets to all be roughly perpendicular to the plane of the system. Four of the bodies in our system, our Sun, Jupiter, Venus, and Mercury, all have axis tilts less than 10 degrees and sort of look like that. Uranus, has an oddball axis tilt, involving its own separate little story. But the other four main bodies, Neptune, Saturn, Mars, and Earth, all have roughly the same 26 degrees axis tilt plus or minus a couple of degrees. That would lead you to believe that those bodies were once a separate system and were captured as a group but, then, you get to the question of what about being captured as a group would give those four bodies roughly the same axis tilts. The basic answer is that those bodies were still, at the time, in the form of one of the herbig slash harrow electromagnetic alignments mentioned earlier. They flew into the plane of the Sun's system from the south at roughly a 26 degrees angle and, as the individual bodies peeled out and began to orbit as they do now, ordinary gyroscopic force caused them to retain that 26 degrees angle of approach in the form of axis tilts. As you can easily imagine, all of this had to have gotten the attention of everybody living within the system at that time. This capture of the southern part of the system was the root cause of the various catastrophes which you read about in the Bible as well as other ancient literature. The other thing all of this implies is that, prior to that capture event, our system existed in the form of a double system, a very bright northern part consisting of the Sun, Jupiter, and Mercury and later Venus which is a fairly new planet, and a very dark southern system consisting of Saturn which was a brown dwarf star at that time, Neptune, Earth. Mars, and possibly other bodies aligned with Saturn as described above. Given that picture, and what we just went over regarding humans and their smallish eyes, you would have to at least suspect that humans would have originated in the bright part of the double system, and not the dark part. 
But there is more to the story. The thing about aquatic adaptations, Elaine Morgan listed a hundred or so traits which we share with other aquatic mammals, but there are a few which stand out. Voluntary control of breathing, which is an adaptation for swimming and diving. We take that for granted, but monkeys and apes do not have it. That is the only reason they cannot teach chimps and gorillas to speak English, they can be taught to communicate using deaf signs perfectly well. Face-to-face -face sex. Marine mammals do that, land animals generally don't. Shoulders adapted for swim strokes. The motion to swim is the same as to throw something like a javelin or use an atlatl. Humans have that, primates and hominids never did. That is why Neanderthals were limited to thrusting spears while early humans had atlatls and javelins. Lack of a decent sense of smell. All land prey animals have vastly better senses of smell than humans do and would go extinct very quickly if they did not. A sense of smell is not terribly important to an aquatic mammal. Again, Elaine Morgan lists something like a hundred such aquatic traits. Elaine Morgan's aquatic ape theory can be viewed two ways. Viewed as a new version of evolutionism, it is just another flavor of BS. Viewed as a theory of human adaptation, it is the best theory that has ever come down the road, but it has never gotten any traction in academia and there are two reasons for that. There is no fossil evidence of any sort of an aquatic ape ever having lived on this planet, and there has never been a body of water on this planet which would be safe for humans to live in. Perfectly good theory, it just needs a different kind of a world to happen on. An original human home world would need four things. 1. It would have to be bright, the relatively tiny human eyes. 2. It would have to be warm, the lack of fur. 3. It would have to be wet, the aquatic adaptations, and 4. It would have to be safe, both from sea monsters and from cosmic radiation. As noted above, an original home world within our system would pretty much have to have been in the bright northern part of the system and not within the dark southern slash Saturnian part. I mentioned that Jupiter would have been up closer to the sun prior to the capture of the other bodies and that Ganymede, just slightly smaller than Mars would have been a freshwater ocean world under those circumstances. That is the beginning of the Ganymede hypothesis. HTTP colon slash slash www. Cosmos in collision. Com. The standard claim of Ganymede having a massive outer mantle of salt water is bogus, there is little or no sodium around Ganymede. The lighter outer mantle needed for the ultra-low moment of inertia is pumice and not some vast outer mantle of water. The place originally was a water world with islands and floating bergs of pumice and luxuriant vegetation. The Ganymede hypothesis is the most major advance there has ever been in our understanding of human origins and the origins of our solar system. For those interested, the following sources of information might be of interest.